Hey peoples, welcome to Monkey See Monkey Review. I am your review monkey, Nick Meanahan. This is a brand new show on the channel where I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite fantasy, science fiction, comic book shows that are currently airing. In fact, in the beginning, it's mostly going to be superhero shows since that is the main thing that I watch on American television. Don't you worry, this is not a format change. You're still going to see all kinds of board gaming goodness, but this is just a little something extra I wanted to do on the side because I am always asked in my weekly Q&As, what did you think of Arrow? What did you think of Ages of S.H.I.E.L.D.? Blah, 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 blah. And I, well, I'm more than happy to answer, but maybe it's better to put all of my thoughts about a week's episodes into just one show. And that is the main goal of this show. Um, and there's a lot of different things I'm going to cover, some things I'm not going to cover, things I would like suggestions from you as to what I should cover. We're going to get to all of that, but we're going to do that near the end of the show. Suffice to say for right now, this is a fun little thing that I want to do. It's just something that I want to try, see where it goes, see what it does. I'm open to suggestions, open to constructive criticism, open to just I hate your guts criticism, whatever you want to do is totally fine. Um, and honestly, one major reason I wanted to do this, I'll say up front, is that I'm so happy that all these shows are coming back, uh, primarily because it is just a really depressing time in the United States right now. It's, I'll be very honest, the election is just bumming me out. Everything around it is just bumming the hell out of me, and it is nice to get our escapism back. And I mean, there's good shows throughout the year, but now is the time where some of my favorite shows come back, and I can't wait, and I want to share it with all of you, and hopefully we can collectively cheer each other up. But we are going to start off... Um, you know, there's not much to cover this week, but starting next week, there's going to be a whole lot more. But there's one superhero show that premiered this week, and that is Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. back for its fourth season. When we last left off, Agent Coulson and his intrepid band of, uh, I guess, like underground S.H.I.E.L.D. agents at this point uh, had been f uh, finally it seems, defeated Hydra, but what was left of Hydra had um, conglomerated around this evil villain named Hive. Um, and humans have been a huge thing in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. storyline, and some people have said that uh, they've effectively ruined Inhumans for the Marvel Universe, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We'll see what happens there. Uh, but they did have what I thought was a very interesting idea in bringing in Hive, who was like, um, in the comic books, he was this evil thing that Hydra created. But in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show, he was actually in, an inhuman who was supposed to be like the harbinger of doom, who would um, uh, who could control inhumans. And um, he actually, uh, hence the name, he could take over bodies and absorb people's memories. And he uh, inhabited the body of Grant Ward, who was a star of the show from the very beginning. He was a double agent, became evil, and then he died and was taken over by Hive. And then it seemed finally... By the way, this show going forward is nothing but spoilers. All the time, all the time. So if you... <laughs> if we're talking about our show in particular, count on it being spoiled. So I'm going to do that here with the season finale of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the third season, where uh, finally the agents with um, Daisy Johnson in the lead, formerly known as Sky, who is uh, in the comic books, is known as the hero Quake, uh, they managed to defeat Hive, but at a great cost. Lincoln, one of the other Inhumans who has lightning powers, um, essentially trapped himself in Hive in a space shuttle and blew themselves to smithereens and presumably killed themselves. Death seems to be a little more final in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it is still based on comic books, so we'll see what happens. Grant Ward is such a great villain that it's hard to see that they would just give him up forever, but... Then again, having them come back would make not a lot of sense. But where we left off, essentially, was that that happened. S.H.I.E.L.D. seemed to be out of the uh, out of the woods for the moment. But Lincoln was the love. <laughs> Somehow became the love of Daisy's life. I don't know. We'll get to that in a moment. And Daisy did not take it very well. Quake did not take it very well. She became a vigilante, taking on the Quake name and uh, in, I think, L.A. And was just uh, going around, like, stopping crime with her powers and became a rogue agent. She did no longer want to be a part of S.H.I.E.L.D. And that was not sitting too well with Coulson and the rest of his group. That's where we left off last season. Now, come to season four. And it, the show basically starts in midi arrest. So it assumes that some amount of time has passed since um, Coulson and Daisy separated and from, from the rest of the group. But we don't know what's happened in that intervening time. And the show starts off with a bang, right with a car chase and Daisy doing her vigilante thing. But there's someone else in the mix. And if you saw any of the promotional trailers for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you know that Ghost Rider was coming to the show, which seemed like an odd fit. And I'll touch back more on this in a moment, but 
it is definitely a sign, as many have speculated, that Marvel is getting ready to introduce much more mysticism into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That's always been a huge part of the Marvel Comics. But now with the advent of their next big movie, which is Doctor Strange, they want to say like, hey, all you casuals out there, and by the way, I would consider myself somewhat of a casual, but all you casuals out there who thought that, oh, it's going to be aliens and superpowers and technology and armored suits and, you know, fantastical stuff, but grounded in at least the plausible, now we're going to throw you for a loop and say that there's magic. And so many speculate that Ghost Rider in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., since Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. sort of takes cues from the movies, this is their way to sort of uh, do a soft introduction of um, that aspect of the universe. So you have Ghost Rider, and it's actually the Robbie Ray's version of Ghost Rider. This is a version I was not familiar with. I was a big fan of the Danny Ketch version of Ghost Rider in the 90s, um, who was the, uh, he was actually the successor to Johnny Blaze, who was um, the one depicted in the Nicolas Cage movies, the infamously bad Nicolas Cage movies. And, but Robbie Reyes is the most recent one from their Marvel Now initiative. He is a Hispanic gentleman, a young, kind of a young kid, basically, um, who, in the, I don't know if the show is going to stick to this or not, but in the comic books, he was actually possessed not by a spirit of vengeance, but by, like, an evil ghost who gave him powers. Um, you can read more on that uh, uh, for yourself. I'm curious to see where they go with that or if they abandon that idea altogether but he is hunting down gangs in this show and that's one of the things that i have a problem with this in the starting episode is that it's very nebulous what is like i guess there's the gang and there's the watchdogs who were like a a racist inhuman hating group from the previous season um and they're involved somehow and there's the chinese mafia we'll get to all of that but it's pretty confusing but we're starting off with him chasing down a group of these since they're white guys i'm guessing they're the watchdogs and uh, Daisy intercepts, so like, hey, I'm, no, I'm going to stop this, and had heard about Ghost Rider, but not by that name yet. And you see this really violent opening scene of Ghost Rider slightly off camera. You can't see his face. You just see the flames of the car and him just violently murdering these thugs. Now, that's one part of the show that I like already is that it is not afraid to go there. Now, it is ABC. It is uh, Disney you would expect that there would be a little bit of hesitation in doing that sort of thing. But to their credit, they said, no, this is Ghost Rider. This is what he does. Ghost Rider does not have a no-kill policy. He kills. He's a spirit of vengeance. And uh, this one definitely seems to be in that mold. Now, he was a, definitely a anti-hero starting out. We'll see where that goes, whether that he develops a no-kill policy with the influence of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Who knows how that's going to go. But we get a little fleeting glimpse of Ghost Rider in the beginning before we go into the wider episode. But let me take a moment here to talk more about Daisy. Now, I like Daisy. I, I really do. It's Daisy Sky. I'm just going to refer to her as Daisy at this point. I actually think she's a, a great actress. She, you know, she's very charismatic. She uh, delivers her lines well. She's got kind of that snarky millennial thing going on. And I'm totally down with that. I think her powers are cool. The show is limited in its budget. We'll talk more about that as we go on, too. But I think for what her powers are, they do as good a job as they possibly can. So I'm okay with her. Uh, I'm more than okay with her in general. I do not like what they're doing with her character now. First and foremost, I am not buying at all that she has was so in love with Lincoln that him dying just shattered her so much that she became this dark goth, like it looks like a goth bum who is a vigilante and, take, and finally takes on a code name and goes around solving crimes. I, I'm not buying this transformation from that incident. She even says some really hackneyed cliched line about like people around her dying or losing anyone else. And I'm just like, I don't buy this at all. I mean, that's not that does not jive with my with with how I saw her growth depicted throughout the show. It's just way too sudden. But and and I also don't like the fact that she is being depowered in the in this show. Essentially, um, she still got her powers, but now I guess because she doesn't have access, um, it, I guess she doesn't have access to the special gloves she had in previous seasons. Now she's like um, her powers to cause tremors are causing like hairline fractures she's fucking up her body and i i just hate that i hate it when heroes lose their powers that's the whole reason we're watching come up with some other creative way to do it but she's supposed to have been experienced now we've had two seasons of her having i think two seasons right effectively of her having her powers 
why is she not better at them? So I'm a little disappointed with what they're doing with her character right off the bat. And again, I like Daisy, so it's a really sad thing uh, for me to see. But um, we'll get back to her in a minute. So after a very brief sort of kind of fight with the thugs and some cool car effects, uh, we go back to the S.H.I.E.L.D. team on the bus, the flying ship. You see Coulson, you see Mac, they're bonding over a game of backgammon, which, by the way, is a terrible game. Um, and I hate to see that they're not willing to say, I, I don't even like this game very much, but hey, have them playing Settlers of Catan. Something. But I digress. Uh, but I do like the Coulson and Mac are bonding. I like both those characters a lot. Coulson is like the star of the show. And uh, I always liked Mac because he's like he's like the grounded one in the show. He's like the one that you're supposed to empathize with. Like, man, look at this fucked up shit going on. And what, I, what, what did I get myself into? That type of character. But he does it well. So as cliche as that character's type is, I like what he does there. And it's cool to see them bonding because, and there's a lot of time for that now, because Coulson is apparently just an agent again, like he was in the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There are this is one thing I like about the season premiere, which is that there there's a lot of things I like about it, by the way. But we'll get to that. Um, there's this whole shadowy new director, and you don't know who he is. You don't, I don't even think they refer to him by the male pronoun. Maybe they did. I might be wrong on that. But they're being very shadowy about who this character is. Uh, I would love to hear any speculation that people have on that, because I'm thinking, like, it's Tony Stark at this point. Because wasn't he actually the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. at some point um, in the comics? Just very briefly, maybe. I think it was after Civil War, as a matter of fact. So that's where I'm thinking, like, after Civil War, he takes over what's left of S.H.I.E.L.D. because of the Zokovia Accords, which they do reference multiple times in this episode in a very clear way to try to connect these two parts of the universe as much as possible. Uh, but I like the whole like, aspect of, you know, here's the shadowy director. He looks like he's very militant, very authoritarian. He's trying to keep tabs on all the agents, making them do daily lie detector tests. And Coulson in uh, Mac are actually trying to sneak away when they can to find Daisy, who is considered an enemy of S.H.I.E.L.D. now. And, they're, and they have strict orders to not do that. But they're looking for any excuse. Along with that rebelliousness is May, who I've always liked as well. But she's kind of a one-note character. She gets a little more nuanced this season. Well, she had nuance last season with, um, I, I think his name was Andrew, who was her ex-husband, who became Lash. That's another romance they didn't quite buy in the show. But regardless of that, she gets a little more nuanced this season with her strike team. So now she's like a teacher. She's the mentor of this strike team, um, who is pretty impressive in what, the, what little they do in this episode, despite the fact that one of their members looks like a very young boy. I don't know what's up with that. But <laughs> digressing again... Uh, I thought I liked her arc of how she's clearly not trusting the new director, who again, no one in the show is actually referring to by name, and how she butts heads with Gemma, and that's going to, you know, Fitzsimmons is back, and they are a thing in this show. I was never a big Fitzsimmons uh, fan personally, but I like them individually, which is interesting enough. And I like that Gemma here is um, not as like sheepish and mousy as she used to be she's very strict and she's like listen i don't like the director either but i gotta do this in order to um keep in his good hit his or her good graces i'm not sure and try to protect us from this person and may is not really buying it so i enjoyed that arc back at the shield lab i also like the fact that um when colson and mac finally decide to they find some excuse again with this weird gang thing that i didn't quite understand they find some excuse to go out to L.A. and look for Daisy, you know, and uh, Simmons hooks him up with a bunch of uh, tech, or Fitz hooks him up with a bunch of tech, which is really cool. I like the bionic hand that Coulson has, which is now effectively his superpower, <laughs> and exploding pens and things like that, and hopefully the gun axe makes another appearance. So, uh, now we go to another little subplot, which was the android um, that was built by the creepy doctor, whose name I couldn't even remember because he was such a forgettable character, and uh, Fitz, who was just there to watch the uh, football game. And, look, I like that they're having little subplots and there's little intrigues and things, but I thought this was the, the worst part of the show for me. I had no interest in it. It seems like it's some sort of backdoor plot device to get Jocasta into the show. Her name was Ava in the show, The Android. But Jocasta was the female Ultron. They even mentioned Ultron in the show, like, oh, this is dangerous, you're going down the Ultron path by making an AI... So I am curious if that's going to happen, which might make this payoff worthwhile. Not that Jocasta was that memorable a character in the comics, but uh, in, in any case, I'll have to see where this goes, but this was definitely the flattest part of the show for me. 
So in any event, um, eventually all plots converge. Daisy does her investigations to try and find this ghost rider who finally has a name in some pretty wicked looking wall mural art in L.A. And uh, I keep saying L.A. I hope it's L.A. I think it's L.A. Uh, and then uh, Mac and Coulson are tracking her down to the area. But in, they're also tracking down this Chinese gang. And this is where things get confusing because there's Chinese gangs. There's They track these people who are murdered who have an infinity loop. And I'm not actually sure what that means. Um, and they're mentioned in the Watchdogs again. Someone in a hospital dies who was a thug. Um, there's just a lot of really weird tangential things here. And maybe if I cared more about it, I would have been able to keep up with it. But at this point, I only am caring about our main characters and Ghost Rider and finally seeing him again or it again. And But hope, but thankfully, we don't have to wait too much longer for that. There's a showdown in the Chinese warehouse where there's this mysterious box, which I kept thinking, of course, as most people did, what's in the box? What's in the box? And they do, they reveal it, actually. It's a ghost. A white ghost. So, <laughs> that is to say, a Caucasian ghost. So, I don't know what's going on uh, at this point. But it is very interesting. It infects them and makes them kill each other because they start seeing each other as, like, wicked undead. Which is very reminiscent of um, something else I can't quite place. But I'll probably remember it at some point. Or probably a lot of things. It's kind of a cliche and fantasy and science fiction but may gets infected as well and so we'll see where that goes um she sees colson as a some sort of disturbing ghoul while they're playing backgammon but honestly that might not be that she's infected it might just be because he's making her play backgammon and she's seeing her uh she's seeing him in a whole new light uh, <laughs> i really hate backgammon but uh at the same time this is going on, this was a weird thing too. You expect like all right now ghost rushers ghost rider's gonna bust in and and and, and fuck all these guys up no, he's off in a junkyard fucking around with Quake, uh, which is like Quake tracks her down, and then they have a rumble because I guess Robbie Race doesn't want to be found out as being this quote unquote serial killer who's been killing all of these gang members, and they fight, and this is where the show has its best moment because yes, it's uh, I would like to say that the story and the narrative is the best part of any show, but really it was this fight that it was leading up to, and then special effects were very good. I like the flame effects um, leading up to the main event when he finally reveals himself i like quake's powers and how she uses them even though it is sort of low budget uh effects at that point but finally we get to see robbie rays explode into the ghost rider and he looks amazing they did a fantastic job with the effects of his flaming skull head which is more helmet like in this version of ghost rider if you look really closely, you can see that there's not actually that much CGI or anything going on. They're kind of, you can tell they're just being very creative with how they shoot it. I don't care. It looked really, really, really good. Didn't pull me out of the narrative at all. I was just like, oh. so that was totally worth it at this point. They had a really great fight. Uh, I would have liked to have heard him talk and say, I don't even know if this version of Ghost Rider does that sort of stuff, like, who acts like a completely different person, like, you will be judged, as I am the spirit of vengeance, you, your sins have been seen, that kind of crap. That didn't happen, that would have been cool, even if cheesy, instead you just get a longing look as Ghost Rider leaves her pinned, she manages to escape though, and then they go to their separate ways. But since the Chinese gang thing was uh, fixed, I don't know where they're headed off to. Is she going to chase after him? It was kind of a, a, a weird way to end that um, fight. But of course, it was just a tease. We'll be seeing much more of that character. I'm actually curious whether he's a first half of the season character arc thing or if it's going to hit his involvement will stretch out over the whole season. We'll see. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has a, uh, a tendency to totally switch gears in it after its mid-season finale. I hate that mid-season finales are a thing, by the way, but that's a whole other topic. With all that being said, I would say that this was a good season opener for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and a good episode in general. I've always been a fan of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I thought that it hasn't gotten quite the love that it deserves because of its horrendous first half of its first season, which was enough... It wasn't even that horrendous, but it was enough for people to swear off the show altogether not knowing that it really got awesome in that second half and it's had its ups and downs but it's stayed consistently good so far uh since then and i do think that this is another example of just a a good episode i think that they made very good use of ghost rider and he was introduced very well i'm excited to see what they do with him i can't i don't like what they're doing with daisy i can't shake the feeling that this whole mysticism thing is just being 
force fed into this episode when it's really not the kind of show for that. Quite frankly, I'd love, maybe this is a, a, a backdoor way for him to have his own show where you can see a much, much darker side of the Marvel Universe. But as it is, because you're going between spy stuff and the typical S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff and Fitzsimmons and androids, it feels very staccato. It's like, we're doing this now, now we're doing this, and this is completely different. So I felt that the episode was a little all over the place as far as its tone. Tone was the one thing I kept thinking of, like, this is this really dark, or are we just doing the buddy thing, and then goth quake is not really working for me, but I can see maybe there's some sort of chemistry between her and Robbie Race. So there's bright spots in the episode, which ironically are the dark spots, but it still felt a little awkward. I'm curious to see if they can pull everything together into a more cohesive whole. Um, if, 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 so I'm hesitantly anticipating what's coming up in the future. Definitely this could have been a lot worse, and I think that um, just making Ghost Rider's um, first appearance in, the, in this uh, universe so um, compelling was enough for them to get across the finish line on this episode. So I'll give this first premiere uh, a, a thumbs up. All right, so in the future, since I'm going to be covering multiple episodes of a show, you probably won't get so much of a detailed review um, for individual episodes of the shows we're going to be covering, but I have plenty of time to kill on this opening episode, so I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm open to any of your uh, thoughts about how I should proceed with that going forward. But for now, let's talk more about, let's spend the rest of this episode talking about what we're going to be covering in the future. Obviously, superhero shows are going to be the major focus, or anything based off of a comic book, uh, primarily, because... Just by their very nature, that's what interests me. So starting off next week, I think next Friday, as a matter of fact, September 30th, we're going to get uh, Luke Cage, which I am super excited about. First off, it's one of the Netflix Marvel shows which have been, so far, very great. Ups and downs, Daredevil did not know how to end either of its seasons very well, but uh, there were still lots of great stuff in both of those seasons, and I love Daredevil as a character. They did him very, very well. They did him justice. And I also thought that uh, Jessica Jones was surprisingly great from beginning to end, much more consistent than Daredevil. So based purely on that alone, I would be excited for another Marvel show coming from Netflix, but it just happens to be Luke Cage. And while Luke Cage, I think, is someone who is very... um, undervalued and underappreciated in the Marvel Universe. No one really talks about him too much. In fact, he's gotten more press in the past couple of years because of this involvement um, in the Netflix Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, I, I think that this is like the best time for you to be a Luke Cage fan because the rest of the time you were probably just sitting on your thumbs wondering when he was going to do anything major. Although he has been very intimately involved with the Avengers since um, the original Civil War. I know that much. Uh, but I still am very excited for this because... Uh, even despite all of that, because Luke Cage, I always felt, was very interesting and very compelling. Another, Any of these street-level characters I find much more compelling than the grandiose god-from-another-universe-type superheroes. Because they have very... I mean, and Spider-Man is like this, too, to a degree. He's just much more... He's on the upper side of town. <laughs> but they all have very real-life, you know, down-to-earth problems. Serious problems that they have to deal with. Whether it's, um, you know, loved ones dying, poverty... Uh, just living in really crappy circumstances and having really horrible backgrounds as well. Now, I don't know all of Luke Cage's background, and I'm trying to be kind of like blank slate, tabula rasa, for this coming up because I, I want to go into the show with fresh eyes rather than be burdened by all of his comic book history rather than just a little bit that I know. Uh, but I know that he is, you know, just, he doesn't want to be a superhero. He just wants to be a normal guy. He just wants to do his thing. And it's just not going to work out because he has these powers. He's got these indestructible skin. And he wants to protect his neighborhood, his part of Hell's Kitchen. Um, and eventually, this is all going to culminate with him getting together with Jessica Jones, Iron Fist, which has not premiered yet, Daredevil. And they're going to be the defenders. And I can't wait for that. So, really looking forward to Luke Cage. And I'd actually like everyone's advice as to how I should handle that on this show. Because as you may know with netflix they drop all 10 episodes i think it's 10 of the show at the same time so what should i do should i do one whole episode just about luke cage covering the entire season or should i the av club does it a couple of different ways one of them is that they do one review a day i don't really want to do that but they also do they have a separate reviewer review one episode of the show a week for people who want to pace themselves I think that's maybe where I'm going to go with it. So you may finish the show well before I do. And in fact, I might just watch the show all at once and still parcel it out. But if you like the show and still want to know my thoughts on it, it might work out. 
but let me know what you think. Other things that we're going to be covering, we have all of the CW shows, which is, ironically, no one really would have thought this. I guess you might have because of Smallville, but CW has really become where it's at for superhero shows. You have Arrow coming back. You have uh, Flash. Supergirl has now jumped ship from CBS over to the CW. And you have Legends of Tomorrow. All of these shows are very good in their own right. Some of them ended very wonkily. Um, I thought that Arrow actually had a pretty decent season last year and with Damian Dark as a great villain. People complained a lot about the final episode. I actually thought it was fine, but it was a bit anticlimactic. The whole thing with the nuclear missile was just very out of place. For that show, at least. <laughs> it's just not that kind of show. Uh, but I still thought it was fun. It's definitely It was definitely a lot better than season three, which was let's not talk about that anymore. And I have high hopes that they will finally sort of get on the right course for this coming season. I think that the villain is going to be uh, uh, is it the what, what was it? The Promethe- Prometheus, the Promethean Man, something like that. We'll see how that goes. Uh, the Flash had a much worse season. Now, Flash had a fantastic first season, and that really gave people hope that it was going to be even better than Arrow in the long run. And maybe it will be, but um, because Flash is really good at long runs. But second season was no good. I mean, there were bright spots when they went over to Earth 2, um, and I, I thought that the villain uh, Zoom was compelling for the most part, but it was just a big hot mess by the end, culminating in him initiating, apparently, the Flashpoint paradox again. I don't know. The show's kind of a mess at this point, but it's, it is the Flash. There's lots of promise there, and I have my fingers crossed that they're going to um, get things settled. By the way, all these shows are going to be premiering in two weeks, so it'll be a while before we get to our reviews of those. You also have Supergirl, which was a very... <laughs> Very kind of bland show. It had some bright spots, but it was very watchable. And it was like, are you not entertained? Yes, sort of. But I like Supergirl. I think the main character is incredibly charismatic and charming and endearing. And I'm really looking forward to what they do on the CW, where maybe they'll embrace the superhero aspects a bit more, especially if you start seeing more crossovers. They are going to have Superman. I feel like that's a big mistake. I know that it's weird that like, she's only like ch- texting with him and um, instant messaging him. And that um, there's you know, just like little weird cameos like where you just see his boots because he was incapacitated. I know. That stuff's cheesy and weird. Maybe they shouldn't do that either. Maybe he just shouldn't exist in this world. I just think that that's just going to take all the wind out of Supergirl's sails. I hope I'm wrong on that. But she's the star. Let her shine. Let's see how it goes. And finally, for the CW shows, you have Legends of Tomorrow, which ended very strong last year. There was a some there's a gap of episodes or a spate of episodes in the middle of that uh, preliminary, preliminary season, which was kind of not good. There was one like particular episode that was awful, but they made up for that. They had a big twist, and I think they ended very, very, very strong, especially since the final episode of the season. Um, where you think, like, oh, I guess everyone's just going to disperse themselves back to their time period and everything's going to be fine. Instead, you see the Justice Society of America gets introduced, and I can't wait to see what they do with that. If you're not familiar with Legends of Tomorrow, it's a bunch of the B-list characters from Flash and the Flash and Arrowverse of the uh, CW uh, superhero universe, who uh, DC universe, who, um, if you didn't know, uh, have come together in order to help uh, rip... Uh, Rip Time Traveler, I can't remember his last name for some reason, try and, Rip Hunter, uh, try and uh, stop a madman, in this case it was um, uh, Vandal Savage, from uh, futzing with the timeline and becoming an evil overlord in the future. Eventually they do manage to stop him, but then you have this horrible threat on the horizon, as told by the, um, the emissary from the Justice Society of America. So, I'm really excited to see where they go. Um, That show probably had the best effects out of any of the other superhero shows. There's some really endearing characters. There's some characters they could just do away with. I was more than happy when the Hawk people flew off where Poochie went back to his home planet. Um, But (laughs) thankfully, the best characters I think are still there. And I'm pretty sure we'll get our uh, Leonard Snart Captain Cold back. I hope so. Because he was the best part of that show. And finally, the most, re- the more recent show coming out is a little bit further away that I will be covering is The Walking Dead. Now, The Walking Dead is a show that's also had its ups and downs. And I know that some people have, have totally 
called, uh, walked away from the show altogether, uh, ironically. But I still like it. I still enjoy it. I still think I don't care about the comic book. I just watch the show and I enjoy it for what it is. And I haven't gotten sick of it yet. There's uh, there's few enough episodes parceled out over a great length of time that I don't get sick of it. Uh, so we left off on a really stupid cliffhanger where we're waiting to see who Negan killed. I don't even care at this point. I just want to get back into the story and see how they resolve the entire plot line of Negan. So we'll see how that goes, too. I guess that's going to be my catchphrase. Now, what won't I be covering real quick? I am not going to cover Gotham. Folks, I know that that's arguably the biggest of the comic book shows because it's on Fox. It probably has the biggest audience. It's been around for a couple of seasons. I tried to watch it several times. I have tried to hold back the vomit from spewing out of my mouth several times. Look, I know that some people love that show. I don't want to take that away from you, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But actually, that's part of the reason why I'm not going to cover it. I feel like if I covered it, it might be covering the popular thing. But I'd also be, at that point, as I've termed it before hate fucking the show, <laughs> okay? It is very clear that the reviewer from the AV Club is doing just that, by the way. And I've read, it's funnier to read his reviews than to watch the actual show. Uh, he clearly hates that show, but is compelled to keep covering it. And I don't want to get stuck in that rut. It's not nearly as funny as you just see me grousing about it every single week and just not coming up with anything interesting to say. So we're not covering Gotham. We're also not going to cover Fear the Walking Dead because, <laughs> which is a ways off anyways, I just couldn't get into that show. I tried. As whatever problems The Walking Dead has, it has a much better cast. I don't care about any of those people. I'm also not going to be covering any anime on the show, which I thought about doing, but I, I'm i out of the anime game. There's a lot of anime I still watch, but I cannot cover it the way that the more youthful generation does. I don't get most of the anime that comes out nowadays. There's a few shows that I do follow every single week, like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure and the new D. Gray Man. But I don't think that most people who would watch the superhero shows would care about those shows that much. Maybe I'll do something separate, but I've just decided not to dip my toes into that water. But what I do want to know, is there anything else I should be covering? Is there shows that have have fallen through the cracks? um, Shows that are starting up, preferably, that I can cover from, even if it's not ground zero, at least the new episodes of a new season. Um, In the future, I'd love to cover more interesting and broad shows like the new Westworld, the new uh, American Gods coming out hopefully very soon. I'm not sure when exactly, Uh, but I would love to get more suggestions from all of you and any other suggestions about how to improve the show. I know length is obviously an issue. But thank you so much for watching. This has been Monkey See, Monkey Review. I'm your review monkey, Nick Minahan. Take care. Catch you next time.